Hello and welcome to this video on random and systematic error and their types. This video is a part of our series on epidemiology and biostats. My name is Dr. Wahab Fazal. First of all, I'm going to tell you this video is a sort of an overview of these major types of errors. In my next videos, I go into each type of error in detail. So let's get into it. So the first thing that we're going to talk about today is random error. What is random error? So it is totally an error that occurs due to chance. How do you reduce it? Basically, every time you do a measurement, there is certain amount of error that can be present in that measurement. How do you reduce it? Well, you take a lot of things. You take a large number of observations and then you increase the sample size of your study. For example, if you notice that uh, if you manually calculate the race time of, of participants, for example, if there is a race and you're standing in the finish line and you try to calculate the race time, there will certainly be some amount of error in that time. So what do you do? You make three or four or five people stand there with stopwatches and that in fact reduces the amount of random error because you just take their average. So that is random error. How do you reduce it? You just take a large number of error, uh, a large number of observations and you increase your sample size of the study and that will reduce the random error of your data. What is systematic error? So systematic error is something that we can target. Systematic error is something that we can measure and something that we can actually control. This is an error that occurs due to design. This is an error, error that occurs due to design of the study. And this has further subtypes. This, this has further subtypes. How do you reduce systematic error? You basically change your design. You make a better design, of course, and then you have better instruments. Then you have better instruments. By using better design and better instruments, you do system, you reduce systematic error. So systematic error has further subtypes. It has these subtypes, selection bias, information bias, and then cognitive biases. Let's talk about each one of these in a, in a little bit detail. What is selection bias? Selection bias is when the sample you choose is not representative of the population. What, what does this mean? What does the word sample and population mean? Whenever you want to conduct a study, let's say you want to conduct a study in an Asian population. That's your population. The main group of people is the population. So what do you do? You can't take all of the people of Asia and do a study of them. For example, if this is the population of Asia, you can't include this whole population, millions and millions of people into your study. So what you do is you try to take a very small subgroup very small subgroup, but you try to make sure that this has people from all the different parts of Asia. So this sample essentially represents your entire population because what you want to do is you want to make conclusions about the entire population. For example, if you want to make the conclusion that Asian people are very, very smart, right? You want to make that conclusion. So you will make that small subgroup of people, that sample of people, you take a small sample of people. When you go to the market and you want to try something out, you, you say to the person, you know, give me a sample. That's exactly what you do in research studies. You take a small sample and you try to make sure that this sample is as similar to the Asian population as much as you can. And then you check on that sample of people if if Asian people are smart, you do that by maybe IQ or whatever tests you want to, aptitude tests if you want to do. So selection bias is when the sample of people that you choose is not exactly like the population. And let's take an example to understand this more. So Mercurius says that all apples weigh the same. This is our medical student Paul Mercurius. He, the, every time in our series, he comes up with something new. So he chooses a sample of 100 apples from a local market that deal with only red apples that weigh 100 gram or more. So he goes to the local market and this is a very fancy schmancy store. And this, app, this store only deals in these, these very red apples and uh, only that weigh a particular weight. And now he comes to the conclusion, he comes to the conclusion that all apples weigh 100 grams. But is that true? No, because his sample is not representative of the actual amount of apples in the community or the actual amount of apples in the world, which are all of different colors, different weights, different types. So that's why his, the, the sample group that he chose to represent all of the apple community is not exactly true. It's only red apples of a specific weight. Therefore, his study is affected by something we call the selection bias. Let's take another example. Mercurius wants to know the average number of hours studied by a medical student. He chooses around 
10 final year medical students that study approximately 40 hours per week. These are medical students who are in their MS4. They study a lot. Of course, they study a lot. So he, this contrasts with a recently published study that included around 500 medical students. So this included more medical students that, that they study around 30 hours. So there's a 10 hour difference, which is a lot. So his study was wrong. Why was it wrong? Because he chose, he chose the population. The people that he chose from the population do not represent all of the medical students. If you say medical students in general, you have to be random in your choosing of medical students. You can't just choose final year medical students and that represents the whole medical school. Therefore, this study was also affected by selection bias and its results, which is 40 hours and the actual uh, number was somewhere around 30 hours, were also affected by selection bias. That's how selection bias affects your study. So let us talk about information bias. What is information bias? Information bias are errors in collection measurement and interpretation of data. So basically, they can affect collection, measurement at any point during the study, data collection, measurement and interpretation. If you have errors, you basically have something we call information bias. And information bias has its own load of subtypes, so does selection bias, and we'll talk about those in their separate videos. Let us take an example to understand information bias a little bit more. So a researcher is trying to study the alcohol use in a community. The religious culture of this community is against alcohol use. The reported alcohol use is very low. Now, the problem with this study is that the religious culture is against this. And if you're, stud if you're not collecting your data in an anonymous way, people are anxious to actually come, up, come forward and say this is the amount of alcohol that I use because the religious culture of this community is against it. Therefore, this number may very well be true, right? This number may very well be true. But the problem is that how did you collect your data? Did you tell the people, did you tell the people that this is anonymous, that your name won't go in front of other people, that the data that we are collecting will not come back and affect you in any way, that we'll try to keep it as much secret as we can. Therefore, this is where information bias comes in. This study can be affected by information bias because there's a social stigma against alcohol use. Therefore, people might have problem reporting alcohol use. This is a very specific type of information bias. As I said before, information bias and selection bias both have subtypes that we'll talk about in future videos. Let us take another example to understand information bias. McFluffy wants to know the relationship between lung cancer and smoking. What does he do? He goes up to lung cancer patients and asks ask them about their smoking use. And he does the same for people who are not affected by uh, lung cancer. So what does he do? Most lung cancer patients report smoking exposure. Now what is the problem with this study? The problem with this study is that if you ask, if somebody has developed a negative outcome, which in this case is lung cancer, and you ask them about the exposure, whatever the harmful exposure might be, the odds of them remembering that harmful exposure might be very high as compared to people who have not developed the negative outcome. So people with lung cancer, if you ask them about smoking exposure, they will say, oh, I do remember I maybe smoked that one cigarette that long time ago, 20 years ago in that specific hut. And if you ask the same question to your controls or people who don't have the disease, the odds of them remembering something like that are much lower just because lung cancer patients are in that terrible state. So that's the problem with this study. This is a specific, this is again a specific type of uh, information bias called recall bias. So let us talk about the third and final type of systematic biases, which is cognitive biases. We'll give you a brief overview and then in the next video, we will explain cognitive bias and its types in detail. So what is cognitive bias? A cognitive bias is when the personal belief, personal belief of both the investigators or, or, the, in, or the participants can alter the results. So what happens that, that for example, the investigator believes that they, this drug is really, really effective in changing the mood of the patient. So he really, you know, counsels the patient that this drug will be life changing for you. This drug will change your mood. This drug will make you believe things that this drug will make you see things that you haven't seen before. And this sort of has that placebo effect on the patient that the patient also feels like, you know, maybe, maybe it's the drug that is changing me. So that's cognitive bias. They're, they're, the patient is predisposed to believing that this drug is working, therefore the drug actually works for him through something we know as a placebo effect. So this is just an example. To take an example of how uh, somebody belief might change the results is for example, let's take an example. A, a new teacher is told Joe and Steve are the gifted students of her class. She spends a lot more time or, and effort with Joe and Steve working on their math skills. Steve and Joe get great marks. 
So this is something, this is a specific type of cognitive bias known as uh, observer, observer bias. So we also call it as uh, observer expectancy bias or uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you tell the researcher in the start this is a great thing and the researcher starts believing it and the researcher makes the uh, participant also believe it and this becomes a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. As we said, these are gifted students and the teacher actually made them gifted students. Let's take another example of how cognitive bias might actually affect a study. A study is being done to understand the link between increased sugar use and obesity. So, they, uh, so basically the researcher keeps asking the patient about their sugar usage in the research questionnaire. So he, he keeps repeating, but you must, you must consume, the, he keeps asking diabetes uh, and obese patients these questions. You, you know, you must consume a lot of sugar. Don't you think you consume a lot of sugar when you do that? And, in, and then most patients agree. And then he changes the research questionnaire. But this is because of his own belief in his head. For somebody to be obese, they must be taking in a lot of sugar. But that in fact might not be true. Some people are just predisposed to obesity through family history. So most patients start agreeing that, you know, my sugar user might actually be high. Now the takeaway of this lecture, the main things, random error occurs due to chance. How do you reduce it? You repeat the number of measurements, you take a lot of measurements and you take larger samples. Systematic error occurs due to the design, due to fundamental flaws in the design of the study. How do you tackle it? Well, you design the study better and you basically improve your instruments. It has three subtypes. Systematic error has three subtypes, selection bias, information bias, and cognitive bias. Selection bias occurs when the sample is different from the population. So if you took, if you said that all apples taste sweet, you can't just take a, a sample of just red apples. You have to taste a bit of every apple kind of. So you, your sample needs to represent the population you chose it from. Information bias occurs due to errors in data collection, interpretation, and then reporting. Cognitive bias occurs due to personal beliefs and sentiments and they get in the way of your study. In the end, thank you so much for watching this video. This video is a part of our series on epidemiology and biostats. In my next video, I will dissect each one of these subtypes which is selection, information and cognitive bias along with their types and uh, be sure to subscribe to my channel and don't postpone your happiness. Thank you.